Hello, welcome to Real Health with me, Carl Henry. Folks, what is the difference between a meal that you cook at home and one you taste in a restaurant? How do you lift a home-cooked meal to restaurant standards? Well, I've been trying this over the course of the last couple of weeks. I'm delighted to be joined by award-winning chef, TV host, and now author, Mark Moriarty. He brings 15 years of experience into his new book, Flavour, Everyday Food Made Exceptional, to help the home chef make delicious food easy. I'm delighted to say Mark is in studio. Welcome, how are you? Good, Carl, and yourself? I'm very good. I've been very busy cooking all your lovely meals. <laughs> yeah. Uh, your, 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 your roast potatoes with the, polen- with the polenta, they're an absolute Clever winner. trick, easy trick. We cook them at least once a week now. It's just a staple of at least one of the meals. Uh, what else have I cooked? The the lettuce wrap pork. Yeah. With beef. Yuck song. Yeah, fabulous. I love that. With the Thai oyster sauce in it. Yeah, yeah. Fab. Yeah. And then last night's one was the, the satay uh, chicken. Delicious. I love how you pick the recipes that are like minimal effort and maximum flavor. <laughs> Absolutely. Without a doubt. <laughs> Abs- like, yeah, minimal effort. We have a busy house with two young kids. Minimal effort is bang on. So, come here to me. Let's get cracking. Um, the book, yep. Why, is my first question. Uh, why? Well, I mean, we've been doing the TV show for four years. We're on season, oh, coming up on season five of that now, oh, yeah. which is hard to believe. Oh. Which go- has been brilliant. I mean, it started in COVID. It wasn't even a part of the plan. We were going to do a documentary on restaurants again and then obviously they all closed and there was a slot and people <laughs> at the time, remember there wasn't even flour in shops or mm-hmm. supermarkets. So RT came to us and they said, you know what, would you, would, is there any chance you do a really simple cookery show and can you deliver it in two weeks, eight episodes? So we said, well, yeah, we're not doing anything else. I was sitting at home, the restaurant was closed. And actually I learned so much from that, that it was really simple ingredients, really simple recipes people understand add a few tips and tricks from the restaurant side of it and that experience, and all of a sudden you're onto the the winner. And don't over-formula it, don't over-edit it, just make it real. Uh, so four seasons later, I had a bank of recipes. You get all the stats back from the websites, you see what works on social, you see what people are actually making, the yuk sung, the, the chicken satay. And I said, you know what, I'd love to actually document this in, in a book. I'm fed up of Googling my own name on the RT website, looking for my own recipes when I'm at home. I'd like to have something that's, I suppose, a collection of work and almost, uh, not going to say what we're doing is art, but it's like a lot of creativity and thought goes into it. So it's nice to have, uh, uh, what is it, 250 pages of of the photographs and all the recipes for, for people to have at home. And thankfully so far, people have been buying it. And is it hard to pick just 100 for someone like you? I'd say on my laptop, I probably have about 5,000 recipes yeah. on it because I document everything from everything from restaurant to the simplest home stuff. The 100 were easy because, like, I'm not... I don't try too hard with these things. I go, what, what are people actually interested in? So my biggest key was getting the stats back from the RT website of what people were actually looking up. So to give you an example, one of the series, I had this amazing fancy glazed beef cheek that was braised for two hours and then you reduce the sauce with butter and you make it nice and shiny for Christian it's all blah 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 blah. Nobody cares. I think about two thousand people looked it up. Whereas if you put a scone on the website, you have about fifty thousand people who look it up. So that kind of led me to the hundred recipes that are in this book. So hopefully it'll be a very much the hits, the the Oasis Wonder Wall by a hundred. Um and I think that's what people want. And is it fair to say that the book is, is, it's not just another cookbook, is it? It's trying to bring that Michelin star restaurant or the two Michelin star restaurant that you worked in into the home a little bit. And like, if I look at, you know, how to cook the perfect chicken breast, like I cook a chicken breast, I just cook it. But actually you show us how to cook it really and make it taste like it does in the restaurant. So like for in some of the, you know, so it's almost, it's trying to bring the, the reader up a level in terms of their own cooking. Very much so, but I, I wouldn't go down that track of this is restaurant food at home. The the thing about this book that sets it apart is it's recipes your everyone is cooking at home. They're just done in a slightly different way that turn your like what you're already doing from good into into great. Um, I don't think you're going to see any techniques from the re- two mission star restaurant kitchen. I think though the fact that I have worked at that level and won certain awards. Um, gives me, I don't know, I don't want to use the word authority, it sounds a bit harsh, but it gives the experience. Yeah, yeah. It gives you it gives you, I suppose if you're in a lineup of books and you want to make a lasagna on Friday night, you go, Do you know what? There's Mark Moriarty. That recipe's gonna be really simple, but he's worked at the top level and won loads of awards. I'm gonna go with his recipe. And I think that's what the book is, a handbook for your home cooking. And I would hope it's something that like Nevin has done for years, that ten years from now, 
Carl Henry is still going to be picking up Mark Moriarty's first book on a, a Friday night and banging out a, a chicken satay with a, a nice salad. You've a grow for this. I, I've met you once or twice before. Uh, COVID was the last time that we met. You knocked on my door. <laughs> and here's a box of food. Go, go and try and cook this. Begging. Oh, thank begging. You, thank you so much. Uh, and I'm trying to remember what it was. A she- was it a shepherd's pie? It was a shepherd's pie in a dish. I can remember. It was delicious. Anyway, there we go. Your grow for this. Where does that come from then? Have you always cooked? Have you grown up in a family of chefs and really good cooks? Or how did you No, not the love for it? There was no real family history. Um Hardworking family, yes. My actually, all my my sister and my parents ended up working in mental health services, okay. and always have done. So that's pretty close to working in a professional kitchen, let me tell you. Um, but from the food point of view, we would have my father's from West Kerry. We would have spent every time we weren't in school in Dublin, we were down there. Uh, we had a small fishing boat, and I was just massively into fishing. I was massively into lobster pots, nets, hand lines getting up at seven o'clock on a Saturday morning to watch fishing programs on Discovery Home and Leisure. And it just developed from there. All of a sudden you had this amazing seafood. You get to kind of 12, 13 and you go, do you know what, I'd like to learn how to cook this. I was of the age where you could go on YouTube and look up Gordon Ramsay or Marco Pierre White or Hessen Blumenthal. So I had access to all that, was able to learn very quickly. Used to do little dinner parties at home for rent a crowd. And then actually what turned the interest and the love of food, which I'm still mad about and where it comes from and how we make it taste insanely delicious and making people happy with food. Uh, I said, you know what, I could make a career out of this. And obviously that leads you to the professional kitchen. But what was the key for me was transition year in school. And a lot of people will go, oh, transition year, waste of time. And it depends on the, the, the kid's attitude to it. So I said, we did the junior search. And I was fine in school, but didn't really take an interest in doing exams, um, still don't. But I had that chance of work experience. And I was doing home ec, and I had a very good home ec teacher who was a chef in a former life who could see my interest. And he said, look, use this as a chance to see, would you like to work in a kitchen? So I wrote a handwritten letter by 10, sent it off to what I thought were the five best restaurants in Ireland at the time. Got three letters back and spent half a transition year actually working in professional kitchens. No. Some of the best chefs. And I thought it was the most amazing job ever because I stood at the pass. I got fed loads of amazing food. <laughs> and I just remember thinking, this this is it for me. This Being in the kitchen, the atmosphere, the people, the madness. I was like, this is this is what I want to do. And there's, I, I get people now asking me, oh, my kids, Mary and John want to be chefs. And I say, yeah, get them into a kitchen because cooking and chefing are two very different things. But uh, it was amazing at 15 years of age to be able to go in and see it and say, do you know what, I want to do this. And it's a pressure cooker. Mm, very much so. Look at me. <laughs> <laughs> you look very yeah. We're going to get to you why you look so healthy in a little while. But it is. I Presumably, the higher up the chain you go, the bigger the pressure and in mm. the environment. Or maybe or, or not. Maybe not. No, I think it's... I often found that the, the higher the level of the restaurant, the more controlled and systematic it was and the less actually chance there was for things to go wrong developing systems to the point of consistency so if carl henry stood on the meat section once he knows the system the product will remain the same whereas it was the kitchens i worked in where it was maybe throw three chefs in we're going to throw 100 customers in the room we're going to serve an a la carte menu and just work it out that was that was (laughs) the pressure cooker they were the stressful kitchens and what Putting it back to the listener then in their own kitchens, what are the common mistakes people make? I'm sure that it's a very broad question. Yeah. But, you know, presumably there's a couple of things, like so, like when people start to exercise, they always do too much too soon, go too hard, you know. And I'm presuming from a cooking perspective, there's a couple of kind of kitchen things that people yeah. kind of always get right Like I could on. go on about all sorts of attitudes, keeping it really practical if you're cooking at home tonight. Simple things like uh, basic equipment. You don't need fancy equipment to cook well at home. Like literally all I have at home is a nice chopping board, a decent chef's knife, which is... I need to sharpen mine. That's somewhat sharp. Yeah. yeah. You get a stone if you're that way inclined. You can YouTube how to use it. I'm 15 years in the kitchen. I don't really know how to use them properly, but I still get away with it. That would be one. So sharp knife, uh, good chopping board, and a nonstick pan. Even if you have that, you're well on your way. From a cooking point of view I always go back to mince mince is what we probably eat the most of protein wise in Ireland Uh, we've all had the pan that's kind of half warm and the mince starts boiling and it's grey and then you add in all your thing and it's just floating around 
a uh, bit of patience there, high heat, oil, let it fry. Let it go from that sound of steam to that sound of frying. Let the meat get colored and you'll be surprised how much extra flavor you'll get into your spaghetti bolognese, your yuk sungs, your lasagnas, just from that. Uh, the addition of seasoning is huge. Basically the difference between home and professional cooking is the addition of a touch of salt, a little bit of butter here and there, maybe some drizzle of olive oil and some lemon juice at the end. Uh, I'll use the example of buffalo chicken wings. Why do we love them so much? Because they're salty and they're really acidic. So if you have your spaghetti bolognese tonight, add a touch of malden sea salt and a squeeze of lemon juice to it and just come back to me and tell me how that kind of elevates it. And then lastly, I would say your shopping list. I know I've seen you on Instagram, you do your shopping list and you put yeah. it up. Like in the restaurant kitchen, everything is about your portion control, your ordering, your costing. I would, without being that um, framework about it, like at home, I try to plan out something about what I'm gonna do. Mm -hmm. So I'll go and say, okay, you know, I'm gonna go to the meat section, I'm gonna get mince, I'm gonna get chicken breasts, I'm gonna get some nice steaks for Friday. I'm gonna go to the veg section, I'm gonna buy, what's it now, October. I'm gonna buy some root veg, I'm gonna buy some kale, because they're gonna be better quality, grown in Ireland, and they're gonna be cheaper. And then my dry goods, I'll always have my pasta, my tin beans. And I'll try actually come up with three meals I'm gonna plan out, and then come Friday, Saturday, I'll start winging it. I'll say, okay, what have I got in my fridge? I can turn the kind of sad looking slightly brown herbs into a dressing to put on a pasta dish. I can turn the two leftover sausages and half a rasher into the base of a sauce to fold through some beans to make something like that. Um, and the idea is by Sunday, I'll probably go out. That's when I treat myself to something on a Sunday. I want the fridge to be empty at that point mm -hmm. to go again on, on Monday. And you'd be surprised how much money you'll save in a year. Huge. Huge, Huge, as you know. Yeah, that the emptying the fridge thing, like we do that, right? So we kind of have our food shop now where pretty much by Saturday evening, there's really not much left. There's eggs and there's kind of maybe some cereals and milk and a bit of yogurt, but like that's... Perfect. You know, so by 10 o'clock Sunday, it's empty. Yeah. And you go, you clean it, and then you go to the food shop and you put it back in. So that that cycle of food that you throw very little out, you save a huge amount of money, huge. Mm. Like if we, if we were in the restaurant kitchen, what you do is we call it GP or gross profit. So you're... What you're ideally trying to land on is your restaurant takes in X amount of money a week. You want about 30% of that to be spent on just food, mm -hmm. which then get you add staff and you add energy and service charge and all that to, to put it on a plate in front of a customer. But there'll be times where we'll do a projection on a Friday night and we'll say, you know, we have to do an order for tomorrow. We're fully booked for Saturday lunch and dinner. We're closed on Sunday. Let's, we'll say, keep it tight. So it's like, let's change the menu on Saturday. Let's use a bit of that, bit of that. Use that puree, add that sauce to that. Don't order anything on that section and we'll pull our GP, which might be projected at 65 up to 71. And I would treat the being at home like that mm -hmm. as well. It's yeah. like anything that's left over in the bin is, okay, granted, look, we want to be sustainable, but it's not possible. We're all busy, but money wise, we don't want that going in the bin. So like going back to the book, there are plenty of recipes in there for stuff that every recipe you're gonna look at, you're gonna look at the ingredients and pretty much say, do you know what? I probably have all these ingredients. There's nothing I have to go to a fancy supermarket to get. So that's why I wanna be using those recipes to make sure. I know I've gone on there about the tips, but they be the- People love tips. Simple, simple yeah. stuff to run your, your home like a, like a kitchen. And a lot of people will come back with the argument, which is, oh, it takes too long. Mm. It takes too much time. What shortcuts, or are there any shortcuts? Definitely, yeah, I'd, I'd agree with everyone who says that. I'd be in that <laughs> bandwagon. Uh, I like recipes that use one pot, preferably, yep. because I hate cleaning up. Yep. Uh, I use, generally, at home, if I'm at work all day, I'll max want to give myself about 20 minutes preparation time. Uh, and then I'd, I'd like to let it throw it into the oven or throw it on the, mm. to work away so I can be back to work or managing kids or whatever it is. Um, tips for cheating in flavor would be your store cupboard. Uh, dare I say I always have a few stock pots, beef and chicken, to throw into an old spaghetti bolognese or something like that. Bit of Tabasco sauce, bit of soy sauce, lots of pepper, bit of Dijon mustard, these kind of things, which will be a spoonful of this. Uh, I do use the pre-chopped garlic and chili. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, because I just, that's... You know what I found? Time wasted. Elephant garlic. Yeah. Oh my God, it's amazing. Huge. Huge. And if you don't want to peel and prep, use a grater. So I'd stick oh. all the garlic through a grater. Oh. So 
the grater basically turns it into a puree. Throw the grater afterwards straight in the in the dishwasher, so you don't have to worry about it. So that's small garlic things I find kind of like a big chunky fingers, and they're kind of annoying, and they just kind of with the elephant garlic, I can open it really quickly, and it's massive, and yeah. like get loads of flavor out of it. Yeah, they're so. they're those tips. So that's like the <laughs> grater, the the stock pots, the um, like I'll make say a chili con carne tonight, so I'll mince, bang it all in the slow cooker. I'll make three times as much as I need. That will probably become growing my wife's working from home lunch tomorrow with a pre-bought salad. Yep. I might smear a bit of the leftovers in a bread roll tomorrow on the run for a on the run lunch. And then whatever's left over, I'll probably poach some eggs Saturday morning, put it on some toast. So that's how I think about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. No, we do the same. Yeah. yeah. We just whatever we, we kind of portion almost one portion left out yeah. of any meal we make that goes in the fridge. Someone eats it the next day. Just there, and I could, you, you kind of get through it. Um, work-life balance. What's that? You're, re- <laughs> you're, you're, you're considering the industry that you work in, which is probably renowned as one of the most stressful industries. Mm. You have a couple of rules in place that are non-negotiable for you and help mm. you to really look after your, your 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 mental and physical health and your work-life balance, don't you? Yeah. So when I was in the kitchen, currently not in a professional kitchen, but like in the greenhouse, I was there for three, five years altogether. Now we would, I'd be up out the door at quarter past six in the restaurant for seven, full lunch, full dinner with the team, and you not getting out of there before midnight, four to five days a week. Um, so you do have to become very structured if you want to maintain a personal life, if you want to maintain interests outside work, relationships, health. Um, and coming, as I set up my own business now in the next year or two, I'm like, do you know what? I love food and I love my job, but I don't love it so much I want to give up absolutely everything, which may mean I'm probably not going to be a three mission star chef, but that's fine. Um, because that takes like anything to get to the absolute top, 100% focus and commitment. Um, I think from 15 years in kitchens, I've developed a bit of a broader view of, well, what are my, I sat down with and I said, what are the things I want to achieve? What are the things that make me happy? like you would treat a business. What are things that make money? What are things that don't? And I said, I love f- food. I love talking about food. There's TV show, there's books. Uh, I'm good at writing, there's books. Uh, I'm very good at doing kind of open air dinners and events where I talk as I cook. So I have all my brand events, whatnot. Uh, restaurant wise next year, I will have a restaurant. It'll be Monday to Friday and half that will be taken up with private events. Um, food doing food events around brands as well as the the paid customers but i also love uh friends and i value relationships i love my family i love my wife so i have to make time for that i love golf i love sport more than anything so i want to be available to watch the match on a saturday night or play golf on a sunday morning so it's been able to say to yourself i'm working hard enough early in your career to give yourself these options that you know what i'm going to set it up to suit me now, I granted, not everyone listened to this. It's if you have an, a, a bad boss or an employer, it's not always possible, but you can make a plan towards that. Um, so I will always Sunday morning. I always play golf. I will always set time in my diary for I'm going to see my parents on this day, and I will literally treat those things like my work. So, like my diary has my work commitments. So here with Carl Henry today in the studio. After that, I have a call. After that, I'm prepping for a thing. And then tonight, I have dinner scheduled from 6 to 8 p.m. at home with the family. And I know that might sound a bit insincere, but it means it happens. And it's something I learned from my parents that like simple things every day um, add to your energy. And instead of feeling like you're wasting time doing things that aren't related to work, the energy I get from that balance actually makes when I am in work, I'm way more productive and I'm able to plan more and hopefully be more successful. That's a long-winded way of saying that's that's my work-life balance. It's a very mature way of of of, of, yeah. of, of, of viewing your life. Are we always quite mature? Well, no, I, it's, it's actually learning from my mistakes. Okay. So I'll give you an example. I did... What am I? I'm 31 now. So when I was 20 years of age, I did the Irish Young Chef of the Year. Never forget it. I was working in the greenhouse. I was doing, I was of that opinion that if I work longer than everyone else and harder than everyone else, I'll be better than everyone else. Yep. Which to a degree is true. Yep. Uh, worked the whole week, prepped for three months for this competition, had to do two dishes on a Sunday, worked the whole week, every hour under the sun, went in at five instead of seven to practice the dish, stayed 
from midnight till two to practice the dish. Last three days, didn't eat, didn't sleep, went into the competition, came second, uh, complete breakdown, 20, 20 years of age, like you're young. Went out partying, ended up in hospital, didn't get out of hospital for two weeks. And I remember, I suppose it's where parents who work in mental health come in. I did it the next year, I learned from that. So I called a meeting with the guys in the kitchen. I said, I want to do this again. I appreciate your support, but next year I need you to do look after the banquet of 200 people. I need to take a day off the day before the competition. I need to go home early in the week leading up. Still want to do my job. They were very uh, supportive of that. Go into the same competition the next year, fresh as, don't have to look, worry about the banquet that night. Team looked after that and won the competition. Um, and that was the biggest learning experience in my career to date, that it's like sometimes you need to work smarter, not harder, and actually sometimes doing less, if you plan it properly, offers better results. And I've taken that learning through the last 10 years in everything I've done, uh, where I'll schedule. I might go crazy working for a year, but then I'll plan two months where I don't do anything. I work for myself now as well, so it's obviously easier. But it just... it. it keeps me going, keeps my energy levels up. Because what used to get me in the kitchen was going in on a Tuesday morning, having that one job for the week and knowing that you might as well close the door on a Tuesday morning and come back out Sunday morning because there's nothing in between. There was no balance. So yeah, learn from that. Fascinating. I love when chats go kind of interesting places. And it's great because, like, you know, a big thing on the show that we talk about is that balance component. It's, that, it's mental health, physical health, work health, work-life balance. And ba I think balance sometimes gets caught up in, I want work-life balance, well, I want to be lazy. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, for me, it's the opposite. Yeah. It's like, pick your times you're going to work. Do, like, if it's three days, four days, if you want to work 90 hours in those four days, go for it because it's much easier to do when you know in your head you've com put a compartmentalized that these three days, I'm not gonna do anything. And all of a sudden, you become better at your time off and you become better at your time on. Um, and you might still be doing the same hours, but you have that balance. That balance can still be involve a lot of hard work, which I think is always a point that I like to point out when I'm asked about it. Don't know if you agree. Wise words, <laughs> very wise words, I love it. Uh, the book, remind us of the name of the book. Flavour, everyday food made exceptional. Yeah, 100 simple recipes that'll hopefully be your handbook for home cooking and I'm enjoying everyone so far cooking from it, including yourself. Yeah, and we've loved it. We've We really have. We've loved it. We've done loads of cooking from it. I actually find cooking quite therapeutic. I go through phases of it where I cook loads mm. and not so much. But it's, it's yeah, it's like therapy. It's like chopping therapy. And then well, I think the, the last line of my introduction, which kind of sums up why I've done it all, it says, for me, one of the greatest joys in life is like putting a smile on someone's face by cooking them food. And that sounds quite holistic, but it actually is, it's lovely. If Gronya's angry at me, and make dinner <laughs> and it goes some way to helping it. If we've got friends over, uh, for me, one of the best gifts is we make a dinner, we have people over, we have a glass of wine. That's what I love. The very best of luck with it and all the projects for next year. Mark, so great to see you again and thank you so much for coming in. Folks, that is it for another episode of Real Health with me, Carl Henry. We really hope you enjoyed today's episode. Wise words and lots of very simple tips as well. You know where we are, at Carl Henry PT on Instagram, realhealth at independent.ie and we'll see you next week for more Real Health. Sláinte